can you control it all right whoa okay welcome to the techno glass lecture series let's see if this works like it does in my class if i get real quiet okay <laughs> okay well welcome tonight to techno glass lecture series we have yolan daniels from studio sumo um i'm going to give a little bit of background information there's a huge amount of awards and publications and things i'm going to try to edit this down just a bit so she's a founding partner of Studio Sumo, which is, uh, started in 1995. The practice itself has won awards, such as the Architecture League of New York, the Architecture, Architectural Records Design Vanguard Award, American Academy of Arts and Letters Award. And for the students in the room, or for you guys getting thesis, these are the awards you want to look to be applying to when you get your own firm. So don't check out when somebody reads these lists to you, okay? So the work itself, the, the firm's work, has also received awards, uh, Chicago Athenaeum, German National Design Council, New York AIA, and I'm just reading a couple from each of these. And it's also been exhibited in places such as the Venice Biennale and MoMA. She's a, Yolande is a fellow of the American Academy of Rome as a recipient of the Rome Prize in Architecture. She's also a recipient of the McDowell Colony Award, uh, it's sort of like the artist colony in Peterborough, New Hampshire, which I'm really jealous about. And she also is an independent study program at the Whitney American Museum of Art. Her architecture degrees are for Columbia University and City College CUNY. And she's been a faculty in teaching architecture since 1991. And again, I'm only going to list a couple of the schools, University of Michigan, Parsons, Columbia, Washington University. She was the Silcott Chair at Howard. And she's at also at Josai International University in Japan in the departments of global and women's studies. So also think about getting outside of architecture a little bit. She's now a visiting professor at MIT. But I have one personal story. I met Yolanda about 20 years ago when she was teaching at Michigan. And um, this is hard to say, but I was sitting in the lecture hall as a young faculty member, as an adjunct faculty member, and she got up and started presenting her work. And I actually, you know, you, sometimes you remember that one lecture that changed the way you think about architecture, and hers was it. When she presented La Femme Pissois and the beautiful New York apartment, I felt like architecture had somehow changed for me. So please help me welcome Yulan Daniels. Well, thank you, Cassie, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Adib, um, uh, Rudolfo. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, the last time I was here was for a review. Um, and I think it was a, a rainy time. Um, and I, I think that was maybe about 10 years ago. So it's really nice to return again um, and, um, and kind of uh, get to know people a little bit uh, better at the school. Actually, one of my former students is here from WashU. Um, that's really great, Hannah. Um, so I'm going to. Um, I'm going to show uh, one project, but it's one project that's gone through um, different um, gener uh, generations um, because the theme is housing. So um, the project is the I House Dormitory. Um, and I'll kind of go back and forth a little bit. Um, so Studio Sumo um, is uh, my practice with my partner, Sunil Bald. We're located in New York City, um, and we um, have a practice where we uh, have been working on um, in cultural institutions, uh, with cultural institutions, arts institutions, education institutions, and culture, and then um, some residential work some work with the city of New York, and we, we are both um, academics. Um, Sunil teaches at Yale, and right now I'm at MIT. Um, and so this uh, diagram is just kind of showing our practice. Um, 
ironically, even though we're in New York, the projects that we've, um, the ground, ground up buildings that we've designed and built are in Japan. Um, so we kind of have this funny thing where we're big in Japan. It's like no one knows us, but um, we've done work there. Um, so uh, this is just a, a kind of um, shot of the building, the I House dormitory. It's it's kind of called the I House Global Village, and I'll I'll go into that story. The sign that you see here was actually a sign that was on this mound of dirt before there was a building, and we really liked it because it was kind of like the Hollywood sign. So we had to get. Um, we had to go through a lot of hurdles to get permission from the city to um, mount the sign permanently. It was a, a temporary installation that was like just a, um, advertising for the school before they had the building built. Um, and eventually um, they got their approval and it was able to stay there. So Josiah International University um, has students from all over the world. Um, they have students from South Korea, China, uh, Budapest, Hungary, uh, Brazil, um, California. Um, their, their kind of mission is a global mission. Um, what you're seeing are uh, studies that we did um, with their logo, the, J logo, the JIU logo, and uh, maps of the different countries to use in locations at the university. One of the jobs that we have with them whenever we do a project, we've done three buildings um, so far in one renovation, um, is that we often have to do, um, we have to kind of make a pitch for the building, which is like having a really clear concept. Um, and then also we have to help market the building. Usually we make a logo. The building itself is kind of a logo. Um, and we play with the university logo. Um, so Josiah International University is actually the sister university to Josiah University. So what you see here is a map of um, Japan. And this is Tokyo. And Chiba. Chiba is kind of like a suburb. Well, it's huge, but um, of Tokyo. And um, this university, Josai University, has campuses. So this map over here is showing different campuses. It's really hard. Uh, let's see. This is the campus where um, the dormitory is. It's um, near Narita Airport, um, but they have other campuses, one in Tokyo, they have um, one, another suburb of, of Tokyo called Sakado, and they have um, a campus uh, on the shore down here. It's kind of like in a beachy town. The map at the bottom is just like the access map, which basically shows um, how you get to, um, it's a commuter school. Um, it's a commuter school mostly from Tokyo. Um, it's about an hour and a half away. This is um, their uh, campus brochure. So it's, it's all modern concrete construction, um, really just kind of austere but beautiful modernism. It's concrete that's painted different um, shades of blue and uh, purple, which are the school's colors. Um, and so basically, what's important for you to see here is that the, oh, okay. So this is the main um, walk of the campus. And over here, the campus has started to expand. So it, it sort of was building up on all the sites um, within the, the bounds where they were, and then they hopped across the street. Um, no. 
No, I'll, I'll show another map. So the campus is surrounded by rice fields and um, Japanese suburbs, uh, they kind of look like American suburbs. They have A-frame houses. Um, some of them are kind of McMansion-ish, but they are surrounded by rice fields. Um, it's really kind of beautiful pastoral um, scene. So what that other map didn't show you was, this is the main street of the campus, and this is the, the kind of main bounds. And where this yellow, uh, sorry, red circle is, that's where the dormitory is. So they basically hopped over the street and started acquiring more property. So the university is actually ac acquiring property all around their, their kind of central location. Um, you know, they're a little bit like, um, well, just typical universities, I guess, where they're, um, surveying the land around them and looking for places to expand. So um, this is the site where the dormitory ended up on the upper right-hand corner. And below it is a sports field um, where they, um, they built that first. So when we started this uh, building, um, there was the idea that it wouldn't be like a traditional dormitory with a um, like single or double loaded corridor. Um, the chancellor of the university had in mind other kinds of um, university settings. She really had this idea of a village in mind. Um, she wanted to, um, to kind of have uh, like house identities that the students would um, would uh, belong to and identify with and have this feel of a village. So we started with the idea of a community, um, maybe like a family of houses um, and outdoor space um, and this kind of infrastructure of the street that would link to the main campus. So that, that was the kind of idea of the village that she um, she brought to us. So we started this project in 2008, um, and at that time it was actually in a different campus. It was on the Kamigawa campus, which was the one on the, the seaside. Um, and I think part of why uh, the village model um, kind of took hold there was because um, it's not an urban context. It's a context where the buildings are low-lying, more like mat buildings. It's more open to the landscape. Um, and so it made sense. Um, so we started looking at, uh, these are, are just like initial approaches to program where we were looking at percentages of space that um, parts of the program would occupy, whether it's like circulation or um, the, the kind of sleep spaces for the students. Um, I can't really read that. Outdoor space, um, common space, wet space. So blue is sleep, uh, brown is wet, orange is circulation, yellow is circulation, orange is common, and green is outdoor. So we were looking at first like um, different percentages that we could allot to these things. This came from first doing precedent studies of Japanese housing um, types. And so those bars, the, the diagrams with the bars are associated with schematic studies that we did um, like an analyses of housing. So this is looking at like one housing study and the kind of percentages of beds to rooms to um, like uh, common living space to circulation and outdoor space. Um, so this is one by Ito. Um, and we just kind of analyzed all of these different housing types and this was the very first thing we did. Actually, they weren't all Japanese. 
um, but they were ones that we were we felt felt were iconic and that we were very interested in. Um, this one by Fujimoto was really interesting. It was actually housing for um, people who are mentally ill, and the the kind of organization of the housing was to um, help them feel more settled. Actually, even though it's it's not as ordered as, as like, you know, is norm. So anyway, we did like just many, many of these. And that's where we got those bars from. And then we did our own studies. Um, and so we had a barcode study, a hinge study, a grid weave. Um, this one's just called figure because it made this figure sand. Um, the idea of like this thing that kind of uh, circulation that wafted through the project um, and grain. Grain was the one that we, um, that stuck with us. So we, um, we basically presented these, these kind of studies to the client. This was the first thing we presented and it was a little too abstract um, <laughs> and we really liked it, but um, she, she tends to like a story, um, like, um, like a clear concept, but a story. Um, so we, we, we kind of, you know, it was still very diagrammatic, um, but she did like the, the relationship of um, like individual spaces to common spaces and the outdoor spaces to, um, to the indoor spaces. Um, so some time passed and often the projects that we do in Japan, time passes and um, we, we kind of have to go there to make it happen. So it's like you talk about something, but it, when you leave, everybody just kind of goes about what they're doing and if you really want to push the project you have to you know kind of keep being present so 2010 um, she um, kind of came to us again with the conversation um, about the dormitory but this time it was on the main Josai International University campus and across um, the street where the um, where they had just built um, the sports facility. Um, so she wanted us to see how we could take this village idea that we had done and just put it on the site. So the first thing we did was we just took it and put it on the site. We didn't really change it that much. The one thing that we did was add uh, this bar, which is a bar that um, in a way it kind of protects the village. It's a public, a bar of public program. So it has seminar rooms, meeting rooms, cafeteria, things that service the dormitory, um, but are not related to um, sleeping and um, just the functions of, of the dormitory itself. So then we um, kind of developed the studies a little bit more. Um, these are like units like separate units, they're all efficiency units that are um, kind of grouped together around a, um, a, a core, which is um, a core of services, and then also um, outdoor space. So what you're seeing here, the orange is living room, the um, greenish is like service and outdoor space, and so basically, over here is like that's the orange and then the service is in this bar and also the courtyard is there. Okay, so we kind of developed them, put them together um, to make instead of like one family, more of like a community. Um, we had the idea of, of like the outdoor living room. So the long bar, oops, the long bar here, that's the outdoor living room. And then we kind of put them together and it kind of zigged a little. So there's the main circulation space and these outdoor living rooms and then the living spaces that, that 
kind of open out onto them. And it's a, a two-story um, complex, so um, like there's the idea that like, uh, well, in, in the efficiency, we also had to deal with um, students with different economic means. So, um, so there were some units that would be um, a little bit um, nicer than others. Um, and then this is just the, the kind of plan of it with the internal street. So back to that early diagram where we had the street and then the kind of blocks off of it. This is the public program which acts as a buffer to the living and then in this direction are the rice fields. So this direction is the rest of the university and this kind of major street. So that's why the public program was placed there. Um, and this is just the plan showing uh, the development of, of the bars. And these are some views. The idea was that on the ground level, um, the outdoor spaces would be um, visible and accessible so that the, the, um, the outdoor would really be op open to the indoor and be somewhat ambiguous. This is something that we, in our Japanese projects, have explored a lot um, because of the weather. I think in temperate climates, like you can do that in Japan, uh, well, in Tokyo and its surrounds, but not all of Japan, not in Hokkaido. But you can do that here in Miami, or you could do that in you know countries that have more temperate weather. There is more of a, a flow between inside and outside. Um, we also were really just interested in um, uh, relationships between landscape and and like hardscape. So this was um, finished uh, 2010. Um, and we had it priced. Um, so we, we did the concept design and um, in our projects in Japan, we work with um, one of uh, Japan's five largest construction companies, Obayashi Corporation. And Obayashi Corporation is a global corporation um, all over the world. Um, they do large-scale buildings, um, monumental, iconic things like the Tokyo Sky Tree. Um, they do some uh, cultural, like museum um, projects, but for the most part, they do towers and infrastructure. A lot of their work is infrastructural. Um, and so uh, our relationship with Obayashi is that uh, Construction companies in Japan have all trades within them. So they have architecture, interiors, um, lighting, uh, engineering, mechanical engineering. They have landscape. They have everything that you, all the associated trades are in a construction company. So when we work on a project, we work, we kind of like tap into this amazing resource of, um, People. So we, we kind of have a team. It, it's like we have a team that's like a shadow team of architects that we work with. We've been lucky to kind of work with the same people since um, the first proposal that we did was in, I think, 2002. And we've worked with them since then. So we've kind of grown up together and we're really comfortable working. Um, and so this project was priced and it was too expensive. <laughs> so, so it got tabled for a while. Um, and I think like a lot of our, our projects in, well, it's funny, we have projects in Japan where we do a lot of conceptual work and many you know sketches kind of like we did in the beginning of this. Um, and it just kind of has a life and then it comes back and you know maybe it comes back again or maybe it dies and then we have other projects where somehow the time is just right and the client asks us to do something and then it just gets built right away so 
This project languished from 2010 to 2014. We actually did other, other proposals, um, excuse me, for the university in that time. In 2014, they asked us to look at it again, but with cost savings in mind. So we um, kind of, you know, went back to the, the, the edict that we were given addition, uh, originally, which was, you know, we, we don't want a traditional dormitory, and then in the end, that's what it had to be because the most cost effective, most efficient is a bar. Um, so then we started looking at a bar. Um, so th there were, I think, like a few, maybe like um, three spatial moves with the bar. One was that we wanted to um, kind of like punch a big entryway out of it. Um, and then um, it had an international center, um, which consisted of a gallery and um, meeting, like kind of conference meeting, cafeteria spaces, basically all the public program, kind of the public program that um, we had put separately before had to be on the lower levels of this, um, this housing block. So um, the, the most high profile part was the International Center, which was, was kind of like a, um, a wedge that the bar was hovering over. So we, we kind of gutted part of it to make this entry, which looked through to the rice fields, and then had the International Center, and then had um, the units, um, like the units kind of hovering over it, um, what you're seeing here is the, the facade to the rice fields, which was to be a simpler facade. It's a north-facing facade. Um, the building was a concrete building, was going to be a concrete bu building because in Japan that was also the most cost-effective. Um, and uh, actually all our buildings there have been concrete and, um, and they're just... The work is really beautiful. Um, and we decided that we wanted to have, um, on the south facing base, we needed to screen the light, but we also wanted to try to open up the building and not just have housing, but have some, some ways for the students to kind of um, like, um, like have a community um, and spaces where they could hang out, which weren't just part of the dorm. So we have these balconies that project out. It's actually a, a, a single loaded corridor building, but it has two corridors. One corridor is uh, the balconies, which is exterior, and then there's an interior corridor just behind it. Um, then, on, on top of the, the balconies and everything, there are, are louvers to screen out the south-facing sun. So this is the, um, the sort of more developed plan, which shows the international center, the void through the center. Originally, we wanted to put like a, um, a dry garden um, a dry Japanese garden inside. It's actually very expensive, so we didn't have a budget for that. Um, and then the, um, so it, it, it got eliminated, and then the part of the bar, which is the public part over here. So the entry is off this street and then kind of coming through here. This is an outdoor uh, amphitheater. It's actually an area which is, um, used for drainage so that when um, rainy season comes, it floods and um, all the water from the site is kind of managed there. But when it's not rainy season, um, that's where they have outdoor events. So this was the first, uh, it was actually the second image that we showed um, the client and she basically gave us a week to um, re-envision the project. Um, and <laughs> this is 
what we did in a week. And then they um, priced it and, um, and they said, yes, we're going ahead. Um, so what you see here is the International Center. It's a bit heavier than it actually is now. Uh, the entry that kind of projects through public and then this kind of purplish part is the color behind of the dorms of this bar that bridges over. So this is the entry with the dry garden, which didn't happen, but everything else happened. Um, so this is kind of showing a little bit more clearly the organization. The purple is the, um, the International Center gallery and um, hall where people gather um, on the, the left-hand side for you. And then the green is um, a seminar, multi-purpose spaces on the second floor. Uh, the, the dorm rooms start on the right, and then on the left is the public um, kind of gathering spaces for students. Orange is a kitchen. Yellow is, we call it a library, but it's a place where they could study um, and also work, like hang out if they're, they don't want to be in the kitchen um, when they're eating. So that's like the students' public and then the ground floor is more like the students plus the parents and visitors um, public. And then as you go up, it's dorms and blue in the middle are the bathrooms. So some of these um, units, um, well, I'll go into that later, but some of them have bathrooms, um, some of them don't. They have shared bathrooms. Um, so this is just the shot of uh, the, the slabs being poured um, and the very organized construction site. Um, while the building was, was being constructed, um, we started to work on the interior. So like you kind of make the, the, the scheme for the concept and then you start to develop it <clears throat> in stages. Um, as it's being constructed. So the little um, dolphins, I guess, are the mascots for the university. Um, and so we wanted to use uh, their colors. Um, Josiah University's colors are blue and yellow, and Josiah International's are a little more feminized. They're um, magenta and a lighter blue. So we were trying to, um, in our studies of uh, how, to, how to surface the um, interior corridor of the dorm, dorms, um, play with the identity of um, the school and also like that students could identify where they lived by a color and we did different schemes. Um, in the end, we ended up with the most um, simple um, like just blue throughout. So 2016 was when it was finished um, uh, being constructed and 2017, um, kind of like in the mid 2017, it was occupied. Um, so this is the plan from above and that's the actual building in its site right there. Um, so this is you know, the way you enter and then you can kind of pass through and, and you can see the rice fields surrounding it here and the sports field, which is like very, very green in comparison. So this is um, the view um, from the, the kind of Hollywood Josiah International University sign. Um, looking through the, the center and then kind of moving closer. So in the development of this project, um, I guess like things I could talk about are, um, I think you can kind of see like the texture of the concrete, um, the bridge. Um, so the texture of the concrete was um, made by using wood, um, like 
wood that, like rough wood, um, that would leave its texture on the um, on the concrete. So this technique had been used. It's a very traditional Japanese technique, and we could only use it in parts of the building. So it was only used on the first floor and the um, kind of walkway of the International Center because it's much more expensive. The rest of the building is, is kind of more standard um, concrete. Um, then the bridge, um, we kind of went back and forth a lot with the engineers because we wanted the bridge um, to be less visible in the hole, but it's a very long span. So um, the engineers, because of like um, in Japan, earthquakes are an issue. Um, they wanted us to just, we, we kind of have to over-determine things. So it had to get bulkier and bulkier. Um, and we, we lived with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the other thing that you're, you're kind of seeing here, so, oops, sorry, I'm a little messy with this. So this is the bridge that connects people from the dorm over to like their kitchen and their hangout spaces. There's an outdoor deck here. Um, this is not really a projecting balcony. It's like a, an entry onto the deck. So this is one of these things in the design that um, we thought was a good idea when we were doing it and we weren't really sure it would work, but it did. Um, so often there are these things when you're doing a design where you're not really sure how to do it, if it's gonna work, but if you work hard enough, it actually does work. Um, so the space that I was talking about is this space right here where, um, and it could have gotten valued engineered out, but actually Obayashi worked with us to make it happen so that um, you could actually enter and exit through here. Um, there's also a normative way to move over there. So here you can see, um, like, uh, this is a breezeway. Here you're outside, here you're inside. Um, let's see, what else can I show you? I think you can see the double corridor. Okay, so this is just a view from the approach from the car. Um, you can kind of see how the International Center um, here, like we made it more open actually than when we first drew it, more open and inviting. Um, and on the other side is a garden. Um, there's a gallery, a garden. Um, so this is the main entry where um, parents and people who are taking classes and things come students would probably enter from the, the right end. This is just kind of coming in. And you can kind of see a little bit of like the projecting balcony. Um, and let's see, when we did the balconies, we wanted to have all of this open. Um, but we, um, and so we first designed it with it open with like a light rail um, but in Japan, there's a real phobia of students committing suicide. Um, so we actually always have to be careful when we design handrails. So like these handrails, um, you know, none of the handrails can, can be, um, they can't be like super light or anything. They can't be something that someone could easily like fall over or jump over. Um, so with the balconies, um, there's, there's a seat in the balcony. Students can kind of sit there. Also, the, there's a the kind of tension when you're doing university buildings between things that students do that you know they do and things that the university you know, gets upset about. Like they didn't want students smoking in the balconies. Of course, some students in Japan, they smoke, um, would, would do that, but you know, but other students would also sit there. So um, that wasn't a reason not to do the balcony. Um, so here you're just kind of looking through 
where this patio is above, garden below, and this is that breezeway space, rice fields over there. Um, when you go in, this is the uh, main reception desk. Um, so we, we basically made it very white. The floors is a very black stone, um, but the reception area, everything about it is white. The first floor is all white. The gallery is very dark. So um, in Japan, uh, black galleries are um, a kind of uh, more traditional approach to a gallery. And this gallery is actually um, exhibiting um, artifacts from um, Prince uh, Takamado of Japan who um, kind of brokered um, a um, World Cup between um, uh, South Korea and Japan. So um, his, his family paid for this space, so it, it actually had to be extremely tasteful. Um, and <laughs> that's why it's dark and it's kind of um, disappearing. Um, and then the rest of it is just, um, the building is mostly white light spaces. So this is uh, one of the seminar spaces. Um, it has sliding doors. Through all the windows you see, um, this is facing north. Um, if it's south, through the windows you see the screen. So this is another seminar room. Um, this is the patio um, outside the gallery um, where students can, can gather and then um, the patio on the lower level and then the patio on the upper level. Um, then just stairwells, um, this kind of has more, actually the blue yellow are the traditional uh, colors for the university but they're also really good for um, uh, caution. Um, <laughs> so we got to play a little bit in the stairwells with some colors. You can see here the kind of concrete, um, like this is, it's basically just um, cast in place um, and um, pretty smooth except for um, at the International Center. So here you can see the double loaded corridor. So, um, so here you're seeing projecting balconies and all of this is open. So it's a breezeway, air comes through here. Um, and periodically you can kind of enter, there are these sliding doors. So one of the things that we were trying to design were these moments where these doors would open and the hallway would not be this wide, the hallway would be this wide. Um, so like when the weather is good. So this is the interior corridor. Interior corridor and then like the kind of exterior corridor. Um, the students typically enter on the right hand side. This, the left hand side is very close to the international center. So they could enter there too, but they're usually walking from the rest of the campus, which is that way. Um, so uh, this, this is a, a dorm um, where it's uh, male, female by floor. So it's segregated um, by gender. Um, at the end, there's usually um, a dwelling, which um, could be for like a a kind of um, instructor or like headmaster. Um, oh, this is another, this is actually the library space. Um, and then this is the kitchen. So these are views of the kitchen and library that are over the um, international center. the balcony, balcony view, looking at the watershed area. Um, and then these are views in 
is actually the unit which is for um, like an instructor or for um, like a graduate student or something like that. Um, then on the other side, there's the unit. This one also has a bathroom in the front. Um, and then the dressing area, but it's for two people. So there's the bed and the desk, bed, desk. This view, all the views are to the rice fields. Um, the spacing of the windows varies um, because it's based on a pattern that we um, apply to the back of the facade. So some of the, the rooms, the windows come in different places. They're not all the same. So this is a view of um, the, the kind of most expensive unit, like the single unit with this uh, sofa, sitting area, desk. And then these are the units that don't have uh, bathrooms in them. So these students would use shared bathroom facilities, um, which we kind of um, It's like shared bathroom facilities, laundry facilities, all of the services that they would need. And it's actually really common in Japan um, to have this type of um, situation in dorms, but even even more so now, um, there are, are capsule hotels, a new breed of capsule hotels that are kind of doing this for um, young and budget-minded travelers. I'm taking my class to um, Japan um, in two weeks, and we're going to stay in these kind of high-efficiency units where um, you have the shared bathrooms, but it's also kind of deluxe. So here you enter into what we call the Angawa space, a take on the Angawa space where you take off your shoes and and like kind of disrobe and everything and go into your room, but then you have to put your shoes back on. Um, probably like your slippers to go to the bathroom. 
So on one side, um, there's a unit for one, a unit for two, a unit for four. So this is a unit for two. This is a unit for either two or four. So in this case, um, the beds are above and the desk is below. So this one is actually a unit for four because you can see the curtains on both sides. And then this is the bathroom. So there, there were like bathrooms um, on each floor. This is actually the men's bathroom, the men's floor bathroom. Um, but then there was like um, one for women. This is the, what it looked like inside. Um, we use kind of um, stock. Uh, shower cubicles and toilets um, to make it um, very cost effective. So um, So just in terms of the, the cost, um, it was about $250 um, US dollars per square foot. Um, and the total building area was 3,000 square meters or 30,000 square feet. The bar is very thin. It's nine meters um, by six meters long. So the average unit size is um, well, a two person unit is like six meters by two point five meters. Um, and a four person unit was a little bit wider. It's six meters by 3.6 um, meters. Um, and then the deluxe unit is longer. So it's um, the same unit as a quad, uh, same width as a quad, but longer because it has the living area as well as like the sleeping area. So now we're just kind of like 
on the outside of the building again. Um, okay, so these uh, louvers, um, they, they're kind of like um, interlocking <coughs> in like the X direction, but then they're also projecting the depths vary. Um, so um, I think you can see it in this detail here, like the depths of the different louvers are varied. And this was actually um, a design that already existed with the manufacturer that we just kind of tweaked a little to get um, to to work the way that we wanted it to work. Um, so in this project, everything about it is is very um, efficiency minded. Um, but the one thing that uh, well, two things money was spent on were the, the kind of international center gallery and then the louvers. But because the louvers were working functionally, they were screening the sun and it was a real issue that we have that, like a lot of buildings um, in Tokyo have screens, extensive screens. Um, it was seen as being um, affordable. So this is just uh, two views, one looking uh, kind of toward the International Center, one looking toward the, um, the main campus um, from the outside of the Project. Then here you're seeing the south side and then kind of turning around to the north side, which is essentially the back of the building here. Um, on the north, it's the bicycle entry um, where people can park their bikes. And then this is the north face of the building. Um, And this shows just a little bit more of like the, the kind of concrete texture. And the building at night.
So, um, so one of the, the things um, with the dormitory, um, I think like part of why um, there were the delays in its construction, um, like there were, uh, most Japanese campuses don't have dormitories. Um, students live at home. Um, but there were two factors. One is that this is an international university and they had to house students from abroad. Um, and, and that was like something that was, you know, part of their mission, but also it affected their funding. So they really needed to create housing for them. But then also internally in Japan, um, the population is shrinking. And I mean, that's part of why they were looking outside to get more um, students from other places. Um, but then the Japanese themselves are not living at home, um, you know, as much as they used to. So the family structure is kind of changing. And so those were like two things that um, I think made the project maybe slow to happen, but then also made it um, an imperative for it to happen when it did. Thank you, Yolanda. So, um, this is the inside.
single building um, for Yukioi uh, prints, traditional Japanese prints. And um, that building had, uh, it was like a box in a box. The interior box was solid because it couldn't let light in. And it was canted. And then the exterior box, had slits and let light in. And, and we spent a lot of time designing a random pattern for the slits. Um, I, most of the Japanese projects, we kind of work with the idea of random patterns, like randomness. Um, and it's interesting because randomness um, is actually not random when you have to design it. Um, it may look but it's not, you have to design it. So, so that, that building was concrete, concrete with slits. And when we did this building, um, I think, like, we really, the light effects of the museum were really great. And we wanted to play with light, but in a, we wanted to do it in a different way. And we just kind of noticed how ubiquitous the screens were in Japan. So we knew it had to be an efficiency project. We, we couldn't spend a lot of money. You know, we, we had done, we had tried to like have more lavish public spaces, double height, you know, open spaces, and the budget couldn't afford it. But, but they would do the screen, and because the screen is, is it's shading the sun, it's ubiquitous, and so that's kind of how we got to the screen, because it's the south facade. Um, we wanted to, you know, just kind of play with the light. Of course, it had to be a random pattern. Um, that was kind of how we got there. Thank you for asking. One quick question about the pattern, though. It seems to me that the pattern was, it was like some sort of subconsciousness of the grain coming back in 
into the project is that the grain had wrapped itself up the facade from the earlier plans. So I was reading it as though you were taking some of the earlier ideas of grain and actually bringing them back in through the project in a different way, which I thought was really interesting, particularly when you compare it to the rice fields in the same kind of patterning yeah. within the fields. I thought it was really beautiful. So, Samir? I, I have another question that is like more theoretical based and uh, so it's about like in your work you talk about the terrorization of power and race and gender so I was thinking like I thought that dormitory would be like your presentation was very comprehensive and thank you for that but dormitory like posits itself as uh, as a in between program that goes like it's part of the institution but it's also housing so i was wondering how you how like your vision like through like power and like the theories of power like could like informs your design throughout the project because as you said this is like an international school and you get like different people coming in so it was just wondering if it affects or if you can like I know, like, all the limits of, like, the, um, the budget and everything, but I was wondering. <laughs> well, I think you're kind of speaking more to, like, um, <clears throat> to culture. You know, like maybe cultural limits, and um, it's a segregated building, right? Like there are, it's male floor, female floor. Um, they are not supposed to be mixing. You know, um, but even in Japan, they are mixing, but we had to design it that way um, because for the, I mean, again, it's like the heads of the university, um, things have to be done a certain way, like, you know, the genders had to be separated because that's the proper things to do, um, even if that's not actually what people do. Um, so I, I think in, like, in answer to your question, like, uh, this is not a 
project that I would design, you know, like in, in here, like that I would, would kind of um, question, you know, gender roles or things, you know, it's not what I kind of do in, like, say, research work that I do here. But the way that um, the way that I see it is like the projects in Japan. They're very much about learning about another culture, and then kind of being sensitive to that culture and working within their milieu. So um, there have been a few instances like these kind of cultural glitches have happened where we maybe um, didn't get it right because we 